I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn with us to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42, and we'll be there shortly. Again, I'd like to say that we are thankful for each one of you that are in service and remind you of our small groups this evening. Most of the groups start at 6 o'clock and our church-based life group at 4.30, youth at 6.30, and so we'd love for you to be a part of the ministry that takes place on Sunday evening. Wednesday evening at 7, we have a great time of worship, and then we have a lot of different electives available that cover a lot of different subjects and topics. I know we're, we're discussing the Holy Spirit, His work in your life, who He is in the auditorium. We've got a marriage class going on. We have a discipleship class going on. There's a lot of different options, so... If you've not, uh, just put it on your calendar, be with us on Wednesday evening. I I guarantee you'll be blessed for being here, and we encourage you to to take advantage of that. As well, I'd like to say thank you to all of you that have contributed so generously to those that were impacted by the tornadoes over the last couple weeks. It's been a trying time for our community, and God has been faithful, and even from the ashes we see God at work. And how many knows that God can take what Satan means for evil and turn for good? Yes. Amen. God can somehow, some way, give beauty for ashes. That's just what he does. That's who he is. I'm thankful that one day he stepped into my life. And he turned me around and he's given me a purpose for living. And you can, you can say the very same thing about your life, your testimony Thank God that we woke up this morning redeemed and and knowing that our hope was in Him and that our help comes from heaven. Praise God. What a a glorious Jesus we serve. And and so we we, we, we encourage you to continue to pray for those that uh, are rebuilding. And uh, we're still involved. We're still funneling resource into these neat areas. And and so, you know, just let us know if you want to help or you know of someone that's in need. We have several, even in our body, that that we are, are working to help as well. And uh, so, believing God to make those things happen. It was this last week that Vicki was in one of our local stores. She does a lot of ministry in our local stores. <laughs> she feels called to our local stores, and, and she takes it very seriously. She's passionate about ministry in our local stores. She was there, and... Uh, there's a lady in, in line in front of her checking out. I don't know exactly how the story went, but in, in just this is how it went. Um, Vicki just noticed that the lady just seemed a bit distraught, um, just a little frayed around the edges, um, not a lot of, of spark you know, in her eyes or, or bounce in her steps. She was just kind of going through the motions trying to get, get some of the purchases taken care of and Anyways, a conversation ensued, and, and Vicki simply asked her, you know, how she was doing and, and if she was uh, affected by the tornado, and, and, and she said, yes. She said, we live down in Southwestern, and so we lost her home, and uh, so we lost our barns, and said, we've been in, in the horse business, horse shows for 35 years or so, and said, we lost our horses, and she said, there's just nothing left. And... Um, Vicki simply said, well, I, I hope that things can get back to normal. And her response was simply this, well, I don't think you'll ever get back to normal. You know, there's times in our lives that, that we lose some very precious things. And there's some questions, perhaps, that there'll never be an answer for until we stand before God and He explains it to us. But we've got to believe and trust that God orders our steps that he has already pondered a path before us. And whatever that we're in need of, whatever we're going to face tomorrow, that, that his grace is already sufficient, and that in, even in and through storms and difficulties and loss, that we can shine forth the goodness and the grace of God. And perhaps in our, in our loss, our greatest loss, God reminds us that in the times that we feel like that there's nothing left to live for, that he is truly our Jehovah Jireh, that he is our provider. How many's found that God has always come through for you in a pinch? Maybe not the way you had planned, maybe not the 
architectural drawing that you have established in your own mind that God truly, when you look in the rear view mirror of your life, you realize that God has been extremely faithful. He's seldom early, but he's never late. Can I get a witness? So the lady said, I just don't think, you know, I don't know if it'll ever, things will ever get back to normal. And Vic's response to her was simply, well, maybe, maybe you need a new normal. And Vicky was sharing that story with me, and it just seemed like something lodged in my heart concerning the desire of God at times to give us a new normal. We are creatures of habit. We have our routines. We, we like our, our normal days. I don't know about you, but I don't like surprises. I like to know what's there so I can prepare and plan for them. You know, my wife is very spontaneous. She loves to travel roads untraveled, not even on the map. We have these discussions often. I say, honey, I don't know what's there. And she said, that's the point. There may be something there that's worth traveling in that direction. And I'm the old guy who says, I like that big black line on the map. Where I know where the McDonald's and the bathrooms are at. Can I get a witness? Although we've discovered some pretty interesting territory following her directions. Got lost several times. About got hijacked one time. Other than that, it's been pretty good. The question I want to pose this morning is simply this. What is normal? What, what is normal? I, I think probably our normals are different based on who we are where we're at in life, things we're facing. What's your normal? In biology, normal is functioning or occurring in a natural way. In chemistry, normal is designating a solution having one gram equivalent weight of solute per liter of solution. How many chemistry majors know what I'm talking about? Because I'm not a chemistry major, and I, had no, I have no clue what I just said. In mathematics, normal is right angles or perpendicular. In the medical field, normal is free from disease or disorder, malformation. In psychology, normal is being mentally sound. Look around and see if you find anybody that is medically normal. Mentally sound. Physically, normal is a body temperature of 98.6. And yet, when it comes down to our everyday life, it seems like normal is a, is a bit ambiguous. It's a bit more fluid and open for interpretation, relative at best. But when I begin to dig a little deeper in this whole issue of normal, I've, I found out that normal is, is defined as our usual, what usually takes place, what we can usually expect, or our average. In other words, life's normal is your accepted average, is your standard of living, is your definition of usual. In other words, life normal is a typical day in your neighborhood. It's what you have come to expect. Now listen. It's what you have come to accept, and it's what you have learned to live with. That's your normal. Now, people looking into your life may say that is abnormal. But concerning your own interpretation of your surrounding, your today, you're living in your normal. You know, sometimes you just don't want people to, to bother your normal, even though it is abnormal. Just let me, li let me live in my dysfunction. I'm functioning well in my dysfunction. Can I get a Does anybody know what I'm talking about? But here's the thing that I, I, that I felt, felt interesting as is, is, is I was praying about the message this morning. I felt like the Holy Spirit just simply posed this question and just stirred this question in my mind, my heart. It's simply this, is, is my normal that I've come to expect, that I've come to embrace, is my normal God's normal? 
Am I living the life that God considers kingdom normal? I mean, do I live in more fear than faith? Do I live in more hurt than healing? Do I live more as a victim than I do a victor? Because I'm telling you, friend, when you come to the cross, everything changes. Because when you kneel at the foot of the cross and the blood that was spilled from the spotless Lamb of glory that that only can cleanse a heart from sin, when you stand and walk away from that cross, all things are different. There is a new normal that is established in your life. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, all things have passed away. All things have become new because you are a new creation. There's a new normal. Praise God. How many is thankful that one day you walked away from the cross differently than you came to the cross? And because of the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, you found out what life is really all about. I'm just telling you, friend, you can do all you want to do, pursue every angle you want to pursue, but until you come to the cross and accept Christ as your Savior, there will always be a vacuum. There will always be a void. There will always be a hole in your heart that only God can fill through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So is your normal, God's normal, are are you living on less than God's best? Is your average God's best? Is your standard of living God's standard of living? Or do you need God to give you a new normal, His normal? So we look in Isaiah chapter 42, and we read in verse 5, Thus says God the Lord. I mean, we need to set up and take attention here. Pay attention. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretch them out. Not just any God, but the God who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. <laughs> I mean, you take God out of the formula, there's nothing left. Hallelujah. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, but Jehovah God that stepped into nothing and declared something. Let it be. And there was this God, the only God, Jehovah God, is the God that embraces us as his children. He spreads out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I love this. I will take you... I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind. God said, I want to use you to perform miracles in your land, a conduit, a a channel that I can flow through to demonstrate my glory and grace. I want to give you a covenant to the people to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from, from the prison, those who sit in darkness, for I am the Lord, and that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. And then he says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. I know there's a lot of things that play into this scripture. But then he says, And new things I now declare. I just, I just think that there's times in our lives that God wants to declare some new, some new things over us and move us out of our routine and what we, what we have come to tag as the acceptable life lived. And God wants to declare over us that there is a new dimension, there is a new level, there is much more revelation that he wants us to understand and live in and, and be a part of. I want to declare some new things over your life. How many here could stand some, some fresh revelation from God? So if you didn't lift your hand, either you figured God completely out or you're just not interested. Either way, you need to rethink that thought. God said, I want to declare some new things over your life. It's interesting when you look across the page almost in in Isaiah 43. I just want to read one, one verse there or two verses. 
18 and 19, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? God wants to do something fresh and in our lives. I want, to, I want to make this statement this morning because I want you to understand how, how much God loves you and how, how much God is concerned about your well-being. God takes no pleasure in your pain. God takes no satisfaction in your suffering, no delight in your difficulties. But I believe God, rather, He delights in us. How many believe that God delights in you? You know, as Psalms 18.4, the cords of death... The psalmist said, encompass me. The torrents of destruction assail me. The cords of hell or sheol entangle me. The snares of death confronted me. And in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. And what happened? From his temple, he heard my voice. Praise God. <laughs> Not the voice of the whole world or the masses. Not this collective voice cry to God, but in the isolation of my life, my need, my suffering, my darkness, the Bible says that from his temple he heard my voice and my cry reached his ear. Somebody shout him, amen on Sunday morning. That God cares enough each, about each and every one of us that he is, he takes attention to our, our cry, for his arm is not shortened that he cannot say, neither his ear deaf that he cannot hear our slightest cry. And then it goes on to say in the, in the 16th verse, he sent from on high. Once he heard my cry of distress, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. And he brought me out into a, a broad place and he rescued me because, because he owed it to me. No. Because I deserved it. No. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. I love that. You see, I, I believe God... I believe God takes joy in my life. I believe God rejoices over me. Matter of fact, the Bible says that, that God himself sings songs of deliverance over me. Well, that's impressive. Now, I, I could, you know, I'm not a great singer, but I could come and say, okay, Travis, I'm going to sing over you this morning songs of deliverance. Oh, bless Travis, God. God, increase Travis's strength, oh God. Help Travis's beard to grow, God. Just go through the whole scenario. Just sing songs of deliverance, help some hair to grow on his head as well as on his chin. Just bless him. Raise your hand, Travis. You know, Travis would leave thinking, what, what, what was up with Pastor this morning? I mean, like he drank too much NyQuil last night or something. But when God... Listen to me. When God, the one who stretches out the heavens <laughs> and sends the planets into orbit and keeps the sun shining and the moon glowing, when God begins to sing himself songs of victory over you and me for our well-being and our protection, that's a whole nother level. That's a whole new normal, friends. Glory to God. May we live in the privileges that God has given to us as, the, as children of God. We are, we are not defeated, but we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Praise the Lord. The message continues, says it like this. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before Him. And I love this last line. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to His eyes. Anybody here need God to rewrite some, some text in your life, to edit your life story? Maybe to write a closing chapter that you don't deserve. <laughs> but because of his great love for you, he, he wants you to end up on top. In him, you are the head, not the tail. You're from above, not beneath 
His blessing rests upon you. You're a child of God, engrafted into the vine, adopted into the family of God because of the blood of Jesus has, that has redeemed you from your sins. Praise God. Yeah, it makes me want to take another sip of water. That's good. So I just want to give you a couple examples. And, and I want to go because I have, I, I have Resurrection Cattlemen's today on with Larry's tab, and I'm excited. <laughs> but I want you to take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. Mark chapter 5, just a couple examples here of how that God rewrote somebody's life. I mean, amazing transformation. An amazing transformation. Mark chapter 5. Verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea, Jesus and his disciples. And when Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately they, there met him of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. That was his neighborhood. That was his home. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. So possessed, so controlled by the enemy. No one had the strength to subdue him. And notice verse 5, And night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. That was his normal. That was a typical day in this man's life. Tormented, suicidal, hopeless, helpless, no light at the end of his tunnel. Friends, without Christ, we... We may not physically, literally be living in a cemetery, but, but we are living under the shadow of death with no hope. and no, We have no future outside of him. It is not in, it is not in the finance. It is not in the, in, in the stuff that you accumulate over time. It is not even in family or friends. Our only hope for a future is found in Christ and Christ alone. And so here is this man that he, he, he has nowhere to go except further down. I mean, this is his typical, normal, average, standard life. He's been there. We don't know how long. And this, this is in my notes, but as I, as I mentioned Travis, and we're, we're great friends, but, and Travis won't mind, but I can tell you, this, this young man sitting here beside his lovely wife, Sabrina, this young man lived in the tombs for many years. Always crying. Maybe not physically cutting himself, but destroying himself through alcohol and drugs and perversions. But today... Travis is sitting in the house of God. <laughs> you talk about a new normal. That's a new normal, friends. Come on now. The Kiwanis Club can't do that for you. The Rotary Club can't make that happen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. And the rest of the story, you, you probably know, but Jesus said, hey, ain't nobody got time for this demon possession. <laughs> ain't nobody got time for this. And he cast those demons out, a legion. You can do the numbers. They fled into, or they went into a herd of swine. There's a good reason why you shouldn't eat pork. <laughs> If the demons feel comfortable in a, in a pig, you shouldn't want to go there. <laughs> Edit that off the tape. Um, don't want all the pork growers coming after me next week. But these demons fled into these pigs, and they in turn fled off the edge of a cliff into the sea. And I, and I love, 
Don't you love the rest of the story? Anybody here, you got a rest of the story. Come on now. You got a rest of a story that you've got in your heart, in your hand, on your, on, on, on your lips because of what God has done for you. So when the people that had heard there was a great commotion in the cemetery, God loves messing up. Come on now. He loves messing up cemeteries. I believe it's something about the third day, very early in the morning. <laughs> at the breaking of day. Glory to God. Well, that's another message. But when the people in the surrounding areas heard there was a commotion, they went out to see what in the world was going on because here this herd of pigs had drowned in the sea. But the Bible says that when they came and they found this demon-possessed man that was possessed by a legion and a number of demons. They found him, what? Sitting, not running, <laughs> clothed, not naked, and in his right mind. <laughs> Only Jesus can do that. Friends, that's a new normal. That's what we need to be declaring, and that's what we need to be living in front of those that are looking for an answer. They are tired of roaming the tombs and roaming the cemetery and living under the shadow of death, and they need to know that there is still a God in heaven that can set them free and bring them into a life that's worth living. Give the Lord a hand of praise because He is still God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man, I love that. Praise God. Amen. And the last example is found in John chapter 4. If you'll turn there and just get through this and I'm done. John chapter 4. How many knows that Jesus always seemed to be attracted to basket cases? What does that say for you and me? Huh? Amen. He didn't come for the wealthy and the wise and the healthy and the whole. He came for those that were broken and bleeding. I'm so glad he found me. I'm so glad he found me. In John chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says, when Jesus left Judea and departed, Again, for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. You see, the Jews, they consider the Samaritans, these half-breeds, as nothing more than dogs. Had nothing to do with them. Very prejudiced toward them. But Jesus, I love this, he had to pass through Samaria. It's a choice he made. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. It was about noon. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For her disciples had gone away into in the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus then continued on with the conversation with this woman. Jesus later revealed in this scripture, in this dialogue with this woman from Sychar, she was a mess. She was a mess. Five times married, living with the sixth. A woman that I believe was thirsty for true love and respect, yet looking for love in all the wrong places. Let me just throw this tidbit of advice you will never find what you're looking for until you first find it in Him. Jesus said, Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things that you need. I'll take care of it. I'll bring them to you. But as long as Jesus is just 
one of the items on the list of your passion, your priorities, and not on the top of the list, friends, you'll never, come on, you're never going to get to where you want to go. Let Jesus take you there. Let him take you there. Put him first. He will put all the pieces of your puzzle together. Why? Because he knows how it's supposed to look. And you don't. And so here is this woman thirsty for true love and respect and yet cast off like a dirty rag five times. Five times promised. Five times promises never came to fruition five times so hopeful this is going to be the one this is the this is the difference maker in my life and five times her hopes and dreams imploded around her five times trusting this surely this man this situation this circumstance is going to bring me into a place of normality that I I can wake up in the morning feeling good about it, and five times that person, that situation, turned south, walked away. Her life was a series of miserable failures, broken hearts, and shattered dreams. Her her typical day was a day of dysfunction, depression, and defeat. A woman that was thirsty for love and acceptance, yet ostracized. Listen, she was ostracized and marginalized by the community around her because of her tainted and sordid past and present. No one in their right mind wanted to associate with her. That's why she was drawing water at the well at high noon, I believe, the hottest part of the day because all the other women refused to entertain her presence. They always went early to beat the heat. And in our modern day vernacular, she was nothing more than trailer trash. The Samaritans didn't even want her. And then Jesus... (laughs) And then Jesus steps into her life and says, give me a drink. And she's trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And he goes on to tell her, I'm going to give you water, living water. Water that you will never thirst again. That will well up in you like springs of water into eternal life. And that day, listen, that day she met the love of her life. And he changed everything. And he he edited the storyline. Come on now. And he wrote a new closing chapter. And that woman that was trailer trash became a child of the Most High God. And today, as we are here, She is there. And someday, we will meet her. And she will tell us the story all over again. Why? Because she was willing to allow God to write a new normal in her life. So I close with this. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't don't know what you have come to just accept as acceptable. What standard of living, standard of life that you've just said, you know, this is probably as good as it's going to get. I can't expect anything better. Why? I'm no better. Well, that could be true. But Christ in you, (laughs) Christ in you makes you, qualifies you for the promises and the privileges of the kingdom. Amen. It's not about how good I am, how good you are, how talented we are, but it's the mercy and grace and love of God in us that wants us as children to be well-blessed and well-favored. So if you're living in in more fear than faith and more healing than hurt and more as a victim than a victor, I I just pray you'll let God somehow began to write a new normal for you because he wants to. He has pen in hand. 
And all he's waiting for you is to release him to begin to write a new chapter in your life. And you'll never be sorry. Because what he does, he does very, very, very good. How many is living proof of an edited life, of a new closing chapter because of the grace and mercy of a loving God? So, Father, in Jesus' name, <laughs> Let your glory and your grace, your mercy and forgiveness fill our hearts and lives, oh God. Lord, it remind us this morning that, that you are for us, not against us. God, that you desire to make all things new. to raise us up as living epistles, as a shining testimony to the world that God takes good care of those who belong to him. And Lord, I just pray for those in this service this morning that they've learned to live on the scraps from the master's table and instead of just sliding up under the table and and feasting on the blessings and the, and the promises that you've given us as, as your children, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that you'll do a special work among us. In Jesus' name.